It's great to be together to begin to celebrate this season. Our text for this first Sunday in Advent comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, beginning in verse 25. It reads like this. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the son of man please join me in prayer Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meets. Amen. So this morning we just heard this text from the Gospel of Luke that is dark and filled with kind of this end of times imagery. And we'll come back to what that is in a little while. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about just some of the themes that we see in there and how we might understand this whole thing better. When I was in college, my first major was English literature. I loved story. I loved literature. I loved reading great plays and novels and all of, the, all of those kinds of things. And poetry I would liked some of, but it wasn't really my bag. But, but I really liked the, you know, the imagery that words could convey. And so I thought initially that I wanted to be a high school English teacher. And so English Lit was my major, and so I was studying and I was taking classes like Shakespeare and, you know, all of these great classes about literature. But as time went on, I began to experience something that I didn't expect, these classes and uh, the way that we would talk about the stories and the poems and all of the different things began to just suck the joy right out of it for me. And then I came across this poem by Billy Collins, who was a poet laureate of the United States. I'm going to read it for you now. It's called Introduction to Poetry. I asked them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide. Or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out. Or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. <laughs> they begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. End scene. Um, when I read this poem, 
for the first time, I was like, now that was my experience with English Lit, right? I began with all this wonder at story and the power of words and images and all of these things. And the more time went on, the more I felt like we were just tying them to a chair with rope and torturing a confession out of it. So this idea that we have these images and these words and these stories that mean so much is something that sticks with me. This morning we read this text from the Gospel of Luke. And what I'd like to do is to just walk through this text a little bit, a little section at a time. Now, if you are new to the church, if you're here and you're not really super familiar with the words of Jesus, this is a, this is a, this is a steep climb, right? I mean, we started not with like one of his really memorable uh, parables, not with one of the really great stories where Jesus heals someone or, you know, speaks truth to power or those things. We have this image uh, here where Jesus is talking in a way that is very foreign to us. And there's a reason for that. Beginning in verse 25, Jesus says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, what is going on here? There's so much that we have to understand in context to really understand what Jesus is talking about. And the very first thing we need to look at is that beginning verse, uh, verse 25 there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. The language that Jesus is using here is a language that was familiar to the Jewish people. It's called apocalyptic language. And it has to do with the end of all things. And it has to do with all kinds of um, of a kind of storytelling that we're really not very good at. There are some signs in this language that Jesus is, that the, the audience that Jesus was speaking to would have understood right away. Like in verse 25, when he says, when he talks about the roaring and tossing of the sea, we would understand that Jesus is calling to mind the chaos of the world. Because in the scriptures, anytime you see the mention of the sea and the roaring chaos, it's, it's referring to exactly that. The uncontrollable, right? The unknown. All of this um, kind of end of times stuff. The uncertainty of the world and what might happen next. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the, word, on the world, for the, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then he goes on to say that at that, that time you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Jesus' language here is pointing towards something that's coming. Something that has not yet happened, but that will happen. Something of great importance. But notice one thing. Because our tendency is to hear these kind of texts and to begin to respond in fear. I remember as a child, the first time I came in contact with apocalyptic literature was uh, actually not literature at all. It was a movie at my grandparents' church. Some of you may remember this. They were, they were doing a Bible study on the, on the book of Revelation, and they were watching this movie that was popular in the 70s called A Thief in the Night. Can I get a witness? Anybody? Yeah, there's a few of you out there. So this movie was made, and it was all about how the, you know, the return of Jesus was supposed to happen. Um, I begged my grandmother to let me come to Bible study with them. Weird. I was about 10 years old. 
And she was like, yeah, Corey, I'm not sure this is for you. This is not really, you know. But she relented. I went, and about halfway through this movie, my grandmother was like, looked at me and said, you need to go home. Because <laughs> I was freaking out. So my grandparents lived in this little tiny town in central Minnesota, and the main street in that town was a highway. And they lived about two blocks from the Covenant Church there. And so I left the church by myself, and I'm walking down the highway to go back to, to Grandma's house. And the whole time, I'm looking back over my shoulder, waiting for the four horsemen of the apocalypse to be coming down that highway, right? I was terrified. And then that night, it got worse because I had nightmares. I was physically sick from fear because of the, the way this story was told. But I want you to notice something. Now, we don't have time to unpack the jacked up way we talk, about, we talk about apocalypse and the end times. That's for a whole different series, right? But I want you to notice something in this text about what Jesus says about the end times. Verse 28. Notice Jesus says, when these things happen, you should be terrified, have nightmares, and throw up all over your grandma's floor <laughs> because of the things that are happening. That's not what he says. Verse 28, he says, When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. The appropriate response to apocalyptic is hope, not fear. Not, um, not abject terror, not nausea, but hope. Because your redemption is drawing near. Our response, unfortunately, in the church, when generally when we talk about Jesus coming back, leads to all kinds of horrible, horrific, terrifying images. It doesn't cause us to lift up our heads and to live with hope. It doesn't cause us to lean in and engage this world with the hope of Jesus. Usually it causes us to draw back, to build walls, and to, talk, and to, to build fear, right? But Jesus says that we should, when these things begin to take place, that we're to stand up, lift up our heads, because our redemption is drawing near. Jesus is saying that this is hopeful. Now, he goes on to say, he told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. A couple of things about this little section, this little parable that Jesus tells. One interesting piece in that first line, it's like, why is he talking about fig trees and all the trees, right? Well, this is very important in Luke, because if you remember, when the, um, when the good news is announced at the beginning of the story, it is hope for just some people, right? No, the text tells us that it's hope for all people, that God's favor rests on all the people, right? So when Luke says very intentionally, look at the fig tree, now the fig tree, and, and see this is one of those details we just don't know, right? The fig tree in biblical literature is generally representative of the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, right? Right? And so Luke is very careful to say to look at the fig tree, but not just the fig tree, all the trees. In other words, this, is, this good news is for everyone. And when you see them sprout leaves, you know that the time is happening. The kingdom of God is near. So all the trees, the fig tree and all the trees, is Luke reminding us that this good news, this redemption that is at hand, is for all the people. And then it goes on and Jesus talks about how this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. 
Now here's the thing. We, in, as we look at these texts, there's, we get so interested and so caught up in assigning meaning to all the different things, right? Well, the fig tree means this, all the trees mean this, this generation means this. You know, I remember when I was a kid talking about, you know, you read generation, uh, revelations and you assign, you know, what, I mean, I grew up in the Cold War, right? So everything was about Russia, the Soviet Union, and the locusts were their, their, you know, vicious attack helicopters and all of this stuff, right? So we assign all these meanings. So there is a lot of discussion, as you might imagine, about what does Jesus mean when he says this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Well, we want to jump all the way to the end, right? And certainly I think Jesus is including that end in what he's talking about. But more immediately what Jesus is talking about is his passion. This, we are reading from Luke 21. In Luke 22, Jesus goes to the cross. And all these things are revealed. This is the event that changes everything. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of a new age. It is an unveiling of the mystery of God. Okay, so what's happening here is that apocalyptic is an unveiling. It's letting us see behind the curtain. Now, Jesus goes on and says in verses 34 to 36, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now, there's a lot that we can look at in this. But I think the words that jumped out at me in this text in this time is this idea of our hearts being weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Now, I don't know about you, but one of these phrases seems to be more prevalent to me these days than the others. Now, maybe you are in that space of carousing and drunkenness. If so, you may want to take this text to heart. That's a thing, right? But the, word, the phrase that jumps out at me in this season for us is the anxieties of life, right? I mean, how could we imagine just two years ago what life would look like in this country now? The anxieties of life that weigh us down. These, uh, this idea that just and the way that we deal with those anxieties oftentimes, right, is to numb ourselves. It's to do and to participate in things that maybe normally wouldn't be something that we would fall into. But because we just feel that weight so heavily and we allow those anxieties to weigh us down, that then we start to fall into these patterns of behavior and sin that, that, can, that make us not ready. Because really what we're talking about here is Jesus is announcing that his kingdom is expanding. It's continuing, right? We know from the beginning of the gospel that when Jesus announces his ministry, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And now he's coming to the end of his earthly ministry where he's going to go to the cross and the mystery of God is going to be revealed. That Jesus is going to die and rise again right? And that we're not to lose hope. Apocalyptic, the reason Jesus is speaking in, these, uh, in this kind of language is to point to that hope. It's to point to the hope that God is going to one day set all things right, and the beginning of that setting right is going to take place in just days from the time he tells this story. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to go into the tomb. And he's going to rise again. 
So remember the poetry, the poem that I read. The thing that is dangerous about apocalyptic is that we try, or actually we don't try, we succeed at doing the very same thing to apocalyptic as, G, as we do with poetry. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. We want to be about figuring out all the signs and the the hints and the, well, when is it going to happen and who is the Antichrist and and blah, 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 right? We get so, we'll, we'll like, I once saw a preacher that had a chart that was as big as this stage about all the different ways that the Lord's going to, what's going to happen and when and who it, who is the player and this and that and the other thing, right? And it's an exercise, friends, in missing the point. It's an exercise in missing the point because what Jesus is saying is that his coming crucifixion and resurrection are about to reveal the great mystery of God's love for his creation. That God truly does love the world. That he gives his only son. This is the hope that we cling to in Advent. That the work that Jesus completed on the cross will be brought to completion one day when he returns. We, friends, sisters and brothers, are living in truly apocalyptic times. Things are being revealed. Most of those things have not been pleasant revelations for us. Right? We see our character, both individually and as a nation and as a church, being revealed in how we respond to the challenges of this season in our history. We see our character being revealed in the political unrest and ugliness of this country. We see our character being revealed in our response to the cries of our sisters and brothers of color, to their American experience. Not our American experience, their American experience. We see our character revealed in the way we respond to that. We want to build timelines and point to signs that the apocalypse is coming all the while missing the point, which is to be ready, to be about the kingdom work of Jesus. That is what Jesus is pointing to. To cry out with the liturgy, the ancient liturgy of the church, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. This is our hope. That Jesus has died, is risen, and will come again. Advent is our time to remember that God in Christ was with us in Jesus. God in Christ is here now in the midst of our pain, confusion, fatigue, joy, all of it. He's right here in the middle of it. And he begs us to be paying attention and to be responding and to be living in the way of the kingdom so that when he returns as he promised, we won't be surprised. God was here in Jesus. God is here now in the risen Christ. And one day God will put all things right when Jesus returns. And what he desires for us is to be his people until then. To be about the business of the kingdom and sharing the mystery of the gospel that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Amen.